Good evening and welcome to tonight's MHCN webinar. The topic is, as you can see there and as you will know if you're joining us, collaborative mental health care to support adults in the autism spectrum. And this is a very popular topic and I think it's something that we're going to have a really interesting night teasing out the case study that you will have had a chance to read. So I'm Lynn O'Grady and I'm a community psychologist. I work usually with the Australian Psychological Society managing some of our projects here and I'll do some of this work with MHPN. So I'm very pleased to be here tonight. I'm very interested in, in this topic. It's not, um, I don't work with adults on autism spectrum, but I have done some work in the past with children. So I'm really interested to think about what might happen to those, those children later on. We do have a panelist of um, experts who I'll introduce to you in a moment and, and they're going to share their insights and I'm, I think that'll be very valuable for you all. We have um, 728 people online at the moment. So thank you very much for, for joining us. It's fabulous that, um, that so many people are interested in this topic and I'll talk to the panel in a moment about why, what might be so interesting about this in their view. Um, and of course, there'll be people who will be joining us later looking at this as a podcast later on. So there's many, many people who are interested in the topic. I'd like to begin, though, with an acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. Pay respects to the elders past, present and future, the memories, traditions, culture and the hopes of Indigenous Australia. So you would have had the panellists names and bios already and hopefully you've had a chance to read those when you signed up for the webinar. But I will introduce each of the um, panellists for you so you get to um, see them and see who they are. So we'll be begin with Aileen. Aileen is a general practitioner and Aileen, I'm not sure if we're going to see you, whether we're going to get to see your smiling face. <laughs> I'm wondering if you'd like to share your thoughts on why we might have a lot of interest. Why have we got 700 people out there listening to what we've got to share with them tonight? Any thoughts about why this topic's an interesting one? Yeah, hi everyone. Well, I think that one of the reasons why this is so popular is because it's a really hard topic. Um, and we do see adults with autism spectrum disorder, but we, I mean, I, I don't know, with other people share my views, but I, it's often quite hard to, first of all, find out about them because of the communication issues and also um, where to refer them. So I think it's a conundrum. Mm, okay. So people will be looking for some answers from us tonight then to help I think us. So. Yeah. Okay. No pressure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And next we'll um, talk to Amanda. So welcome, Amanda. And any thoughts that you'd like to add to that in terms of this topic and why we might have lots of interest in it tonight? Um, I think we've got a lot of interest in it because people have really begun to realise that autism spectrum disorder is much more common than we thought and children grow up to be adults. And there's also um, a large number of particularly adults who don't have cognitive impairment out there that aren't picked up until sometime in adulthood and how do we find them, as some people have asked. And also adults with intellectual disability are often missed as well. And so um, both from the perspective of a child growing up to be an adult with autism and the need for uh, many of them to have continued support, we have the issue of um, adults who are coming to us and we think, well, maybe they do have an autism spectrum disorder and what can we do to help them? Okay. Great. Thank you. And welcome to you as well. Anna, you're coming to us from Brisbane. We've had our weather chat and, and you said that it's nice and warm up there and you were in Melbourne recently and it was freezing, even though we thought it was nice weather the last few days. So anything to add to that in terms of what you're thinking might be what, what people are interested in tonight, what people might be looking for? Yeah, hello everyone. Um, I think one of the biggest things is that there's a, a massive lack of information to uh, guide practice in this area with um, adults um, on the autism spectrum. There's a lot more um, research done into how we can support young people and their families. But as um, both Aileen and Mandy said, that these children grow up and there's actually a, a very big lack of information as to what we can do to help support them in adulthood and a lack of um, evidence-based information and, and treatments which we can offer. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Anna. And last but not least, Julian, any thoughts from you about this and what you're thinking with my, what might be so attractive about this topic? Thank you, Lynn, and uh, hello, listeners. 
uh, and uh, uh, those contributing today. Uh, I think from where I stand, the uh, key is uh, how we assess and manage individuals with more complex needs and how we deal with that in a collaborative framework uh, seem to be, to be really key challenges as we put our heads together, a very big group of over 700 people to tackle this quite difficult issue. So I'm looking forward to hearing what other panellists say and looking forward to the contribution from the participants tonight. Thank you, Julian, and I think that's given us a, a lovely taste of what we're in for and already giving us a bit of a heads up about what we might expect. And of course, the MHPN do the work around collaboration. So this is very much the MHPN way of working is to really promote the collaboration. You can see already that we're doing that in terms of the different disciplines and backgrounds that we've got bringing to you tonight together. If you've participated in previous MHPN's webinars, you'll know some of these rules. So I'll go over them briefly, but I'm sure there are some people who haven't joined us before. So of course the ground rules are really important in any kind of um, environment like this. It's a professional development event. We can't see each other, but we know that you are there and it's, I always like to think about it that we're in a very big room together and, and we just um, we know we're there but we can't necessarily see what's happening. But it is important for you to think about this as if you were in a, in a normal kind of space and not in a virtual space. So anything that you write in, in the um, chat box other people can see. So thinking about that in terms of, um, of what you do share or questions and comments that you ask. Um, you can use the participant chat box and this chat box is looking a little bit different to um, if you've participated before. It's a little bit different because there's some new um, sort of platforms that's been required because of numbers, because we've got so many people. So with the help of Redback, we've been able to um, manage that. So if you do have any technical concerns, you do see the technical support um, tab and we have Redback who are there to help and there's a phone number there that you can see as well. You might just want to jot down, but if you do put anything in, in that chat, um, technical support um, tab, you'll be able to get some support really quickly from Redback who always do a, a fabulous job. We also have people from MHPN behind the scenes who are, who are providing support to the panel as well and sending me some questions and things that come through as well. At the end of the webinar, we would like you to hold on so that you can just fill out the quick feedback survey for us. It's really important I know MHPN draw upon that that um, feedback and, and really take on board the suggestions and um, feedback that people provide. So it's really important that, that you do take a few minutes to do that if you can. Um, let me see where we're up to. Um, hopefully you have participated before and you are aware of the process that we go through. Um, if you have joined us before, you will know that there's a case study that hopefully you've all had a chance to read. David is our adult um, that we'll be talking about tonight and his family. And we also have the panellists who will be providing um, some information, a little presentation each from their perspective, drawing out some of the things that they've been thinking about or information they think would be useful for us to be thinking about. And um, then we'll have some time for question and answer. We've already got some of your questions that came through when you registered and we'll be having a poll to help us prioritise what questions, what area of questions we might want to focus on. So there'll be a quick poll and then we'll launch into some discussion and get as many of those questions answered as, as we can and um, including the various perspectives from each of the panellists. So I think that'll be a really useful and interesting um, section. So let's have a look at the learning outcomes. So we'll be using David's story to um, give us the opportunity to describe the role of different disciplines in providing support to adults on the autism spectrum, helping us to recognise the warning signs, prevalence and risks of mental illness for adults on the autism spectrum. So we've already heard from the panellists that even recognising um, autism and, and knowing, knowing if it is autism is, is difficult. So then the connection with um, mental illness as well is, is another complicating factor in there as well, which we'll tease out. And then finally, to identify tips, strategies and challenges in providing collaborative mental health care for adults on the autism spectrum. So fairly big learning objectives that we've got that we're working on there, but I'm sure this panel will be up to it. So let's um, begin with our, um, our GP, Aline. But before I do that, I might just recap very briefly a little bit about our case study, just so that if you haven't had a chance to read it, you'll, um, you'll at least know a little bit about what we're talking about. And you will be able to find the case study in the little folder that's available for you. So um, handouts and other information supporting resources are there as well as the case study if you haven't had a chance to look at it. So I've been through this case study and have made a few notes. So David is in his 30s. 
Um, he is living at home with his parents, so his parents are Linda and Dan. Um, Linda has recently been involved in a, a car accident and is having some time in hospital and there's going to be a, a fairly lengthy inpatient rehabilitation process happening for her. And um, Linda has devoted a lot of her life to, to caring for um, David. And um, while she's in hospital, things are, are kind of becoming really quite tricky at home. So David um, doesn't seem to be coping very well with, with um, her not being there. Um, so what we're really looking at is, is him presenting to the GP. He's looking gaunt, he's exhausted and tense, and he's talking about having a turn. So we've, we've got the physical signs happening as well. So that's just a snapshot to give you a bit of an idea, but hopefully you, you're aware of the background and all the other information that we've provided for you. So let's move on to you now, Aileen, and hear from your perspective as a general practitioner, what are some of the things that you'd be thinking about once you read that case study? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess one of the great things about being a GP um, who has actually been involved with the family for ever so long um, is that you we actually know the full medical history of this patient, David, and also the family history and the background of the psychosocial issues that he comes with and obviously his diagnosis as well and exactly the sort of um, you know, the person he is because we've looked after him since he was a little um, baby and, and also know his his sister and his father as well. So I guess as a GP, um, I, the main thing that I can stress here is that uh, hopefully it's the doctor that actually knows the full medical history and the context of where this person comes from. And I can't stress that enough in the, a person with um, uh, ASD or intellectual disability. Um, many times we find people with or adults with this uh, condition not having a full medical history and that is a, uh, a difficulty when you're starting to build up this, um, you know, a... a, a a, a file or a, a profile of, of your patient in front of you. And I would like to encourage all the GPs out there to, to really go and find out if, if it's a patient who, you know, is the first time they've seen the patient with an intellectual disability or with autism as an adult, to really try and find out as much as they can about this person with research. And I know that we can transfer files, but... Um, it's one of the things that I find challenging as a GP, not being able to get the full medical history. And there are some tips that I might be able to share with you uh, as we go along uh, in this webinar. Um, but certainly it's important to know the background of this person and his context. And also having that existing report understanding of David is really important to start off knowing about where to go from here because one of the, the things which he has presented with um, today or, or that day to his GP could be a physical, mental or behavioural or a combination of these uh, conditions. So one of the things which we know in general practice is that behaviour change is a really common reason for people with autism or intellectual disability to seek help from the GP. And it's great that David came because often... I find that it's either the, the family member that will come um, or maybe the father or the sister, but in this case, you know, obviously the mum is, in, is, um, in, is in rehab. But usually it's someone that's come in or if it's a support worker, someone who lives in the group home. So I think that um, it, it is great that David came, uh, but often we can't jump into, conclu into a conclusion that that person's come because of stress or whatever. It is true that often the behaviour can be a um, attempt for the person to communicate discomfort and distress to you. So as a GP, you've always got to have a uh, high index of suspicion that there is something that this person is trying to tell you, but what is it? And to be able to get that down pat in 15 minutes, it's a real challenge. So I just encourage them um, reflection on that and perhaps some strategies to put in place to deal with that. So the important thing is they've come to you with these concerns. 
as a GP, it's my responsibility to do a, a physical assessment and take a, a medical history about exactly what is going on um, and not jump to the conclusion that it's anxiety or behavioural or whatever, but really take the time to listen to the the um, physical symptoms very carefully. He's come with a funny tummy and he's, he looks gaunt as well and he's exhausted. Is there a physical problem that's um, causing this? We need to balance that with over-investigating because some of the things are fine as a GP. It's often easier to send her for a test or do a, you know, some investigation and inflict people with um, autism or people who have intellectual disability with multiple, multiple tests and send them to specialists without really assessing them in a, in a you know properly and I think that we need to do that as GPs um, and I know that I'm talking to quite a number of mental health workers and psychologists so it is important that you know that's something that you can have a relationship with the GP with is to say look can you physically examine this person or maybe um, look at this person medically for me. GPs are also trained now to look for mental health assessments, it's important that as a GP, I spend some time doing that as well. Impossible to do in 15 minutes, so um, I've got some tips later on if people want to hear about how to get that going. But I'll move on because I know I've got five minutes. So um, what do we know about people with autism or intellectual disability? Well, they will have definitely some existing comorbid physical issues, so we need to be aware of that. And the majority of people with autism have an intellectual disability and, and, and also uh, amongst these people there's a high prevalence of psychiatric conditions. I won't go through these because I know our other mental health specialists will be talking about that specifically, but GPs have to have that in the back of their minds when they're presented with someone who has um, communication problems as David has and perhaps some cognitive issues as well as they've got intellectual disability with their autism. So make getting a diagnosis may be difficult and this is when I think a team approach is really important and using your mental health specialist is really great. Um, I have a master's in mental health but I do like to get my mental health specialist uh, second opinion or an opinion to exactly what is happening to this person. So don't be afraid to refer. I think it's really important. Um, and, and don't jump to a conclusion that this person has, you know, a behavioural problem or that they have anxiety or, or depression or whatever. It could be schizophrenia. It could be something else. So I think it's important to get a, a collaborative view on that. Um, and it's really important to state that people with autism have the right... Uh, have the same right to access mental health services. I think it's really important as a GP to understand that. I think we do, but I, I think sometimes it can be dismissed. And I really would like to encourage our GPs out there to think um, further about this. On the other hand, we don't want to be quickly referring. Again, we don't want to inflict our patients who are already uh, having difficulty in communication and going to different, you know, meeting different people, new people, to have unnecessary assessment. So I think as a GP, being the first port of call in primary care, to really be able to have that assessment um, initially and to think very clearly and carefully about this patient that's sitting in front of you. So to finish off, some cardinal rules for a successful interaction with patients with ASD, be calm, not afraid, don't be dismissive, Speak slowly, not loudly. GPs and other health professionals, I, I know it's our, you know, a little bit of um, frustration. It's human nature. People don't seem to understand or they're a little bit slow. We just tend to speak loudly. And I think that's poor form, but, you know, we have to catch ourselves. Wait for 10 seconds before the person, for the person to speak. We speak very quickly and we, we are, you know, we were able to express ourselves well, but people in front of you might not be, especially people with autism. You can use gestures or pictures, and I often like to encourage, you know, looking at the computer. It's really great now to have computers in the practice, and we use that quite a bit. But obviously in David's case, he might not need gestures because he's quite high-functioning. 
but um, pictures are all, always important to clarify. Uh, reinforce good behaviours and expressions. We're pretty much not able to get that all in one day, but uh, in one session. But uh, just make sure that as a GP, you're able to say, "Yeah, good job." You know, that's really important, and be upfront about giving them good feedback. Get assistance. I talked about the team approach. Schedule a review. And maybe you need several long appointments to get to the bottom of things. So um, I think that's my cardinal rules for successful interaction and being able to treat and manage David. Thank you very much, Aileen. And I, I think there's a lot of tips I do, uh, there already for people to take away that I think would apply to, to a lot of people doing doing this work. It always interests me when I, I um, hear GPs talking about their, their being first put a call and so much to think about and so much to be checking out. So I think that last point around several appointments long to get to the bottom of things is a really important one and taking the time sounds like it's, it's really very important when we're, we're looking at um, patients or clients with, with really complex needs and lots of things going on. So, so thank you very much for kicking us off. It's been a fabulous start. And there's lots of chat happening, so we're really pleased that you're using the chat function and that you're using that so that we can get an idea of the sorts of things that you're looking for. So thank you. And now let's move across to Amanda from a psychologist's perspective. What are some of the things that you'd like to share with us? Hello, everybody. Um, I thought uh, we might actually go back to, to basics and think about autism spectrum disorder as it's now called and there is only one diagnosis and it's based on core difficulties to do with social communication and root and then the second areas routines repetitive behaviours and sensory sensitivities and if you look carefully about what's been written by Dave, about David particularly in his history you can see um, these things uh, you, you can see these things here I think very importantly too we need to remember that the um, there are a number of comorbid conditions that come with uh, autism spectrum disorder, which um, Aileen has already touched on uh, to some more, more or less greater degree. So mental health problems, anxiety, various anxiety disorders, mood disorders, um, insomnia and circadian sleep rhythm disorders, gastrointestinal issues, but also people with autism, which is moving more into the psychologist area, uh, and the, uh, as well as the, um, and particularly the OTs area, fine motor difficulties, poor adaptive behaviour, other mental health disorders, and intellectual disability is uh, also very common. And sometimes with an adult with autism, actually from a psychologist's perspective, they may actually present initially with some um, significant mental health problem that they've come to see you with. And um, they may not have a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, and this might be when you may begin to suspect that something else is happening. In terms of going back to the core difficulties, we now diagnose levels of um, severity. And if we thought about David, he's probably at a level one, so he might need some support in place or some help for social, um, social communicative issues. And he may um, exhibit inflexible behaviours and, uh, and require uh, like to stick to routines and, and so on, so you might need some support with those. So moving on, being conscious that we've only got five um, minutes. From a psychologist's perspective, I really like to think about the background that, um, that uh, people come with and the, the family situation. So very importantly, David's mother, it seems to be a bit of a warrior uh, about David and he's really supported David all his life, as Aileen said. Dad seems to be, be a bit reclusive and as a psychologist I'd start to wonder if he uh, fits on what we might call the broader autism phenotype. And the sister we don't know much about, she's absent and interstate. From David's perspective leading up to his life as an adult, he hasn't, because he was diagnosed late, he hasn't benefited from early interventional support when he was a, a very young child. And um, those sorts of things can be very important. And he does come with a history of social isolation and bullying at school. And we find that bullying, even in the workplace as well for adults, the bullying is a big issue in school in, um, and uh, in social adult situations in the workplace for people on the spectrum. And that can cause a lot of trouble. 
for them. And then in terms of in David's history, if I looked through what we had about David, he, he has these somatic complaints to do with his gut or his funny tummy. It seems as if he's probably a bit anxious. He seems to have some sensory issues and, and routines. He's certainly got anger issues. He's ended up with some good qualifications, but he's underemployed, which we see in the autism spectrum. Um, this is a disability where more people are unemployed than in any other disability, according to the ABS. He does socialise and he has a socially acceptable interest, depending on your football persuasions with the Collingwood Football Club. And um, he's very heavily reliant on his mum. So those are the things he brings to the picture now in his 30s. At the point of crisis pre precipitation, he still seems to have his funny tummy, so something going on there that doesn't sound like it's ever been looked into. He's still got anger man management problems, very reliant on his mother, and his socialisation is very much around a specific interest. So when his mother's hospitalised, there's a big change in David's life, and change is something that um, people on the spectrum don't deal with um, very well. So there's a change in relation to his transportation and therefore his ability to um, engage in his uh, favourite social practices and um, hobby with the football and the football statistics and so on. It's a change in his meals and how much of that's got to do with his tummy and how much of it might have to do with routines, we don't know. And so overall there's been a routine change. Excuse me, I just had to cough there. So from outcomes from a psychologist's perspective, I'm seeing someone who's angry, who's self-injuring, who now has poor sleep, has an inadequate diet, has somatic complaints, he has poor personal hygiene, he's lost his social contact. And he, because he's resigned, he's now unemployed. And some of those things are things that a psychologist might look at and some of those things are things that very importantly need to be um, looked at in a multidisciplinary sense with the GP and OT, maybe um, a psychiatrist as well. So to summarise, he's become isolated. He seems to escalate with mental and physical health problems. So one of the things that psychologists uh, need to think about when someone presents is when they come with these um, things like a funny tummy, it may not be anxiety. It may not be a mental health problem that's making you feel ill. It may be a physical problem. And so, as Aileen said, it's really important to get a medical evaluation. So if you're a psychologist seeing David first, um, you, you really probably should be sending him off to his GP to make sure there isn't anything physically wrong or trying to persuade him that he should go and see his GP. Um, he, once you get into the mental health issues a bit more, you may want to send him to someone like Julian because he may, he may need uh, medication. He may need more than you can provide as a psychologist in practice. And because he's dropped out of work and he's got adaptive behaviour problems, you may want to send him to someone like um, Anna, who's going to talk soon. From a psychologist's perspective, uh, his mental health and his anger management and his sleep are issues that we need to deal with. And his mum's been organising, which suggests he's got some executive function difficulties. And so one of the things that's becoming uh, in we're finding in research at least is important in, in the mental health arena for people with autism is uh, not surprisingly difficulties with intolerance of uncertainty and so that might be an area that we could work on. Anger management relates to people with autism uh, have quite a, can have some significant problems with emotion regulation, so dealing with regulating emotions. And then his sleep problems can be related to his mental health problems and his unemployment and also to this intolerance of uncertainty and problems with emotion regulation. Psychologists to some degree can help with essentially issues and adaptive behaviour as well, but also that's moving into the area of the OT and the OT may be better qualified there. Um, you can make some suggestions that the OT may be better qualified. And really that implies very much what Aileen has said. We're seeing here that we really need all of our parties involved. We need communication. Um, between all people for complex cases like David's appears to be, at least on the surface. 
Okay. Thank you very much, Amanda. Lots of um, other interesting things. So I can see in the chat that this is really creating a lot of a lot of interest and lots of lots of things to be thinking about. I also see in the chat. Just, that you haven't finished? Oh no, I, I'm sorry. I wasn't quite sure if I'd got onto my last slide. I did. Yeah, you I did. got myself confused. <laughs> That's all right, I didn't want to cut you off. I know you had lots, lots of important things to say. Um, I'm just noticing from the chat that there's quite a lot of people talking about their own experiences or family members' experiences. So I'm really mindful that, that we're tapping into a whole lot of different experiences people have who are joining us tonight. So just, just a bit of a reminder about that. We're trying to keep it to um, the case study and keeping the focus on that, but really mindful that, that it does impact on us all in lots of different ways. So just wanting to do a bit of a reminder about that. It didn't take long before someone talks about Collingwood. We put that in the case study and we thought that it might take a little while, but someone, Amanda, you got it in pretty quickly that um, Collingwood might trigger a bit of discussion, but that wasn't coming up in the chat just yet. But it might now. Julian, over to you. You're going to give... Uh, no, Anna, you're going to give a perspective from an occupational therapist. We've got to hang on for Julian. So let's hear from you, Anna. What would an occupational therapist be thinking about in, in the case study? Thank you. Um, so I wanted to start off um, giving a bit more of a, a broader picture of how um, autism might impact on an individual's ability um, to participate in everyday life and to participate in occupations and then focus specifically on, on David. So uh, Mandy touched on this um, when she was talking about um, employment rates of um, people on the spectrum. They tend to be a lot lower than of that of the general population and of other people with other disabilities. Um, from the case study, we can see that uh, David is, is now unemployed. Um, he's decided to resign. In terms of education, individuals in the spectrum um, may have lower levels of higher education attainment. Um, in terms of leisure, leisure activities, um, they, might, they might be restricted to their particular interests. And as we, we see with David, that's really around um, his interest around football. Um, and Generally, social participation um, tends to be restricted um, for individuals on the spectrum, uh, maybe just to a few close friends or acquaintances, um, or maybe participating in online situations rather than face-to-face -face interactions with other individuals. Um, and we saw that with uh, with David, who was, you know, developed quite a close bond with um, with one friend around his leisure activity of um, AFL. In terms of activities of daily living, um, these are things such as um, cooking and, and showering and kind of looking after yourself in your day-to-day -day life. And with David, we see that he does have difficulties um, with, at the moment with showering and that, that has been something which was a difficulty when he was younger as well, but he did receive some um, earlier assistance um, from an occupational therapist to help with that. Um, and we, we see that he, his mum has been cooking for him um, and particularly for his funny tummy um, most of his life. So um, whilst his mum is in the hospital, he isn't cooking meals for himself and he isn't eating the meals that are being provided for him either. And things such as instrumental activities of daily living are things such as um, being able to manage your finances, um, being able to manage um, either public transport or driving independently. And what we see with David is that he's also been reliant on his mum um, for transportation to and from his activities. Um, so as an OT, I've been starting to think about, you know, in these areas, um, where is it that David would like to actually be able to do more of this on his own or to develop skills for him to be able to continue to engage things which are important to him. But as um, as the case study has said, at the moment it kind of seems that, you know, uh, David is in quite a bit of a, a crisis. Um, so generally, in, in that sort of area, it would be really important to have the support of a psychologist, potentially a psychiatrist and his GP, to really help manage that crisis. Um, and then we can focus on getting getting David back to his valued occupations and doing the things which are important and meaningful to him. When thinking about or when doing an OT assessment, it is really important to think about how, I guess, the core features of autism, which Mandy um, went into detail about how they might impact on someone's ability to do what they want to do. So, um, for example, with with um, employment, it be and there was an example there that um, sometimes you know David doesn't get along with his co-workers, and that can be a cause for a disagreement or a conflict in the work in a work scenario. 
So, you know, thinking about, you know, his social communication abilities and whether that's impacting on his ability to communicate and negotiate that social environment at work. Um, thinking about also his sensory sensitivities. So the case study um, didn't go into a lot of detail about whether or not he did have any hyper or hypo sensitivity. Um, but as an occupational therapist, this is definitely something that you'd want to look into in a lot more detail to see whether this is actually something that might be contributing to the problems that he's experiencing at the moment or something that's contributing to him not being able to engage in activities that he would like to be doing. Um, thinking about all of that, we need to also think about the um, individual's physical health and whether that's impacting on their ability to participate. And um, as, as this case study is particularly on mental health, so whether it is that um, David does have anxiety um, and how that is impacting on his ability to do things or whether there is something else going on as well. And as both Aileen and Mandy have mentioned, individuals um, on the autism spectrum may also have um, an intellectual disability. So when working with people with um, a comorbid intellectual disability, it's also important um, to think about how we can then further adapt our practice to meet their needs. So um, whether we need to adapt the way we're communicating with the individual to make it easier to understand, whether we do need to provide materials, um, which are, you know, um, pictures, um, whether we need to demonstrate things more carefully, um, that sort of thing. So the reason I um, put this slide in, in, in recent times, um, there's a lot more research being done into some of the potential causes or mechanisms for anxiety symptoms within autism. And I've included this because within the case study, although we don't know for sure what's going on and we need to um, do a thorough assessment to see whether it is a mental health problem which is causing um, David's current difficulties. It, you know, some of the things which are there makes it sound like it could potentially be anxiety. And I've included this because the research at the moment in this area is quite interesting. Um, so there is research to suggest that atypical sensory function, which is something that OTs are really quite interested in and have a lot of knowledge in, may actually um, contribute to an individual's um, intolerance of uncertainty, which then can go on to contribute to anxiety. So if you, um, you could be nervous or anxious about potentially experiencing some unknown sensations, um, say, out on, on the street, not knowing whether you're going to come across um, a really busy environment that you're not going to be able to deal with or manage, um, manage well, or a really noisy environment. Um, and also there is research to suggest that alexithymia or the inability to, um, to really be aware of your emotions and to be able to describe them and label them may also be related to um, sensory function, which then also impacts intolerance of uncertainty and the presence of anxiety symptoms in individuals on the spectrum. And it's really interesting as well because I've recently come across a, a research article um, the first one that I've seen like this, which has developed a intervention specifically um, for individuals on the spectrum um, based on uh, cognitive behaviour therapy, but around actually getting individuals to manage um, their sensory or their, their, their reactions to sensory experiences in more appropriate ways and to change the behaviour, um, which is showing some you know, early promising results. So that's really interesting and, and something that OTs could get more involved in. Um, just to summarise, in terms of um, an assessment for David, it's really important to make sure that it's quite centred and that the goals that, are, um, uh, that we're coming up with are things that he really wants to work towards in his life. Um, we need to think about all the, sorts, all the factors which I mentioned which might contribute to participation restrictions more broadly um, with individuals on the spectrum. Um, and also those factors which might be contributing to any mental health problems that he's experiencing. So, for example, if it is anxiety, um, as an OT, we could really focus on those um, sensory atypicalities. Um, one, one thing which has been touched on as well is um, the involvement of ed support persons in this assessment and in this goal setting. So, um, you know, David is um, heavily reliant on, on his mum, so whether 
we need to involve her or whether, um, as David is an adult, you know, speaking to him about whether there are other people which would like to be involved or which would like to become, um, you know, bring along to sessions and have support him as well. Um, Aileen touched on all of these kind of adaptations for autistic adults. Um, and I guess I just wanted to, you know, highlight that it's really important to have clear communication when working with um, autistic adults to avoid ambiguous language which may be misinterpreted, um, to use visuals and videos and demonstrations when necessary, and to check that the person has understood you because sometimes the individual might just nod along or they might, you know, look as if they're understanding, but it's really important to just, you know, to double check that they are understanding what you're saying. Um, and particularly also thinking about the individual sensory differences so making sure that your office or the environment that you're working in um, can be adapted to meet the needs of the individual. So avoiding fluorescent lighting where possible and using a lamp, you know, not having, you know, noisy environments. If you have a noisy waiting room, maybe there's somewhere else that um, the adult on the spectrum could wait whilst they're waiting to see you and really being mindful of those things. And I'll hand over now to Julian for the psychiatry perspective. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Anna. Lots of um, fabulous ideas there as well. And, and again, seeing the um, nuances, I guess. So talking about the same case study, but, but really bringing out some different elements to that that can really show the benefits of everyone working, working together. And people commenting on how fabulous it is to have an OT perspective on the panel. So it's great that, that you were here. Now, Julian, last but not least, as I um, as said before, you've been waiting patiently. So let's hear from your perspective now to, to round it off psychiatrist, what would you be thinking about? Thank you very much, uh, Lynn. It's been a really stimulating listening to the presenters that have come before. And I think much of what needs to be said has already been said, so I can, can move through my uh, brief presentation fairly rapidly. One of the important aspects to me when considering the mental health of people with autism is to recognise the diversity of this group, not only uh, in the mental health profile, but also uh, as individuals. Whilst we know that uh, deficits in social and communication, uh, social communication interaction, uh, restricted range of interests and so forth are core elements of autism, uh, we also know that uh, each person with autism is different. Uh, and some of the useful ways of clinically dividing up the group that I found helpful is to think about firstly whether the person uh, has intellectual disability or not associated, associated with their autism and the awareness that uh, people with milder uh, levels of disability, so borderline uh, IQ to mild intellectual disability will likely have a mental health presentation that's very similar to the general population, whereas people uh, with moderate or severe levels of intellectual disability and autism will have quite a different presentation, often dominated by behavioural changes that need to be uh, interpreted uh, and uh, understood carefully uh, to really recognise whether or not there's a presence of mental ill health. There are other uh, broad groupings that sometimes help. People with and without language disturbances uh, are important, obviously, because adaptation to clinical practice vary uh, significantly between those two groups. And also whether or not the uh, autism is associated with a particular genetic condition which has a behavioural phenotype of which autism is part. I think those things, to me, help me understand uh, individuals uh, a little um, more easily clinically because I know that there are particular clinical aspects uh, to those groups that are distinct in some ways. It's been highlighted that uh, mental ill health is generally overrepresented in uh, autistic adults and indeed I think as a rule we could say overall that uh, the prevalence of mental ill health is about two or three times uh, that of the general population for most of the core uh, um, areas of mental health. So I think uh, we could use that as a template of understanding, but then we need to go beyond that and, and, and think why is uh, this individual vulnerable? When we think about that issue, we can 
look at this uh, schema and understand at a biological level that there may be some vulnerabilities conferred not only by the autism itself, but perhaps by a tendency for anxiety disorder. It seems like Linda is a sanitizer and may have an undisclosed anxiety disorder. It seems like Dan, the father, may have uh, a, an autism spectrum disorder uh, himself, or at least be part of the broader phenotype, as Mandy said. We also uh, know uh, that psychological aspects play a key role. So at, at sort of 2 o'clock there, you can see um, if we apply that uh, here to David, uh, he has relatively poor frustration tolerance. He sanitizes his distress. He has a distant father and an overtly anxious and overprotective mother. Uh, and aside those factors that are psychological vulnerabilities, arguably, to mental disorder, um, he has his own issues to deal with, which relate to his identity. Uh, he has uh, a relatively poor adaptation, I would say, to his a diagnosis of autism uh, and is not being supported in the right ways to enable him uh, to attain the best possible standard of mental health and wellbeing at present. Down there at about four o'clock you can see that I've put past uh, um, experiences and there we need to recognise that uh, people um, on the autism spectrum may have higher rates of uh, bullying and abuse experiences, and these may provide significant vulnerabilities or risk factors for mental ill health. We see that six o'clock lifestyle issues, including David's low levels of physical activity, um, could be a risk factor, but actually a relatively protective factor here is that we uh, don't think that he abuses drugs or alcohol at this point, and so I think uh, that's a strength. Over at about uh, nine o'clock, you can see uh, that environmental uh, factors that need to be considered here. Here, mother has been hospitalised. This is a real sentinel, uh, sentinel event, uh, which has led to escalation of his anxiety and uh, plummeting of his mood, and really quite graphic distress with uh, evidence of self-harm and increased sanitisation. And we can see in the social domain at about 11 o'clock, a series of negative experiences, particularly as a child in the school setting, and then perhaps avoidance of those kind of socially uh, based interactions, partly because of previous uh, negative experiences. So all these factors together help us understand vulnerability to mental ill health in David's case. It's already been stated that people with autism, uh, as uh, everybody, have a right to the highest attainable standard of mental health and wellbeing uh, including access to uh, quality mental health services that are tailored specifically to the needs of the person um, on the spectrum. But then when we think of this in reality, we know that people uh, with autism experience a number of barriers to effective treatment. Uh, I ha have another diagram here, and you can see at about one o'clock, communication difficulties are listed. Uh, now, whilst David's verbal communication is okay, uh, many um, on the spectrum uh, struggle in this area. At three o'clock, we see that uh, uh, we can consider lack of skilled and specialised services as being a potential barrier to access to treatment. Aileen made a, an interesting comment earlier that uh, don't be afraid of referral uh, to a colleague, but actually, um, Aileen, I think it would be fair to say you have very, very well developed um, uh, professional networks in this area. And I wondered whether uh, people participating today have those networks as richly developed uh, and may in fact experience difficulty uh, finding a suitable specialised service uh, to which to refer. Down at about five o'clock, uh, David's and those around him's knowledge about health uh, and mental health issues can provide a significant barrier. It, it's often the case that it's not until a major crisis emerges that actually um, action is taken by families in this situation. I think in some uh, ways it reflects perhaps low expectations of what mental wellbeing uh, might look like for an adult on the spectrum. Uh, that's perhaps also low levels of literacy um, about uh, mental health and uh, available treatments uh, and a lack of uh, ability to access those. At about seven o'clock, we see health professional skills and training. We know that uh, many 
in this field struggle because at an undergraduate and postgraduate level there is often very little contextualised training on developmental disorders within curricula uh, and a few opportunities for professional development. Of course this panel and your participation is an exception to that. At nine o'clock we see carer and disability professional skills and training as a potential barrier. This isn't uh, relevant to David but in many people on the spectrum, those with intellectual disability of significant severity, often a barrier is uh, the carers uh, themselves not being aware of uh, appropriate services and support and not knowing how to access them. And quite up high um, on that uh, um, barrier treatment uh, picture there, you'll see interaction between services. Uh, for me, the uh, thing that I experience in clinical practice is um, a lack of uh, a cohesion uh, in support for people on the spectrum with mental disorders. Often uh, clinical service delivery being uh, punctuated by demarcation uh, of role rather than having a person-centred uh, and holistic framework of support. And real structural difficulties as we try and come together as professionals uh, without a really clear model or practice model on how to do that well. Uh, and service systems to an extent and the funding sources counting against us as we seek ways to overcome that barrier and do things better. So if I can progress to my next slide. So I think Aileen and others have outlined beautifully key ad adaptations in assessment. Uh, in specialist psychiatry services, uh, these are very similar to what's already been stated. Uh, preparing for the consultation, knowing uh, uh, your um, documentation that's come with a person seeking it if it hasn't been provided. Obviously effective communication with the person and those that have come with them, engaging with carers uh, where possible and appropriate, having sought the um, permission of the person themselves. Taking that broad developmental perspective which is sometimes lost uh, with adult clinicians as they uh, assess before them an adult not really taking that long-term uh, view of how the disorder has impacted on the person as they've progressed through various life stages with various tasks uh, to achieve at uh, different life stages and how when uh, autism has impacted uh, that developmental pathway, the impact on the person themselves and on their sense of mental health and wellbeing. Uh, Anna has outlined brilliantly the sensory aspects that uh, really need to be considered. Uh, here we see David with very sort of sharply developed interoceptive um, awareness. Uh, he somatises could uh, some of that um, sensory sensitivity around interoception be what drives uh, to some degree his uh, hypochondriacal concerns about his gut uh, and his need for a special diet. Aileen outlined physical health comorbidities. I put these here again just to highlight that uh, to me there's a key hierarchy. If I see somebody presenting uh, with an apparent mental disorder, one of the first and most important aspects here is assessing the physical health potential uh, drivers of that change uh, for the person. Uh, we know that in uh, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, a large proportion of health conditions are not actively managed. Uh, or um, inadequately managed and so this to me seems very important. And of course assessing behaviour, there can be substantial diagnostic overshadowing uh, and uh, this is more of a feature of course in pe people with much more severe disabilities uh, uh, than David's but needs to be stated here. The key management issues, I think the, the uh, need for a comprehensive formulation using multiple sources of information and incorporating the input from other disciplines is a key and incorporating that medical knowledge and uh, the, the awareness of any influence of medical conditions on the mental health profile. And developing from that clear hypotheses about what could be uh, the key uh, triggers and perpetuating factors in the mental health uh, of um, David. Um, having uh, a way of uh, interdisciplinary practice that has the person at the centre and supports them without then needing to overcome the barriers that we create between our uh, professional disciplines as we uh, practice in our silos. Obviously uh, psychological therapies I see in David's case as in most uh, 
uh, people presenting in this way uh, being the primary and enduring uh, 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 treatment modality, but then having a sense of, well, what does responsible prescribing look like in this setting? And, you know, rather like Hamlet Act 3, Scene 1, uh, to prescribe or not to prescribe, that is the question. Uh, in this situation, dare I answer that, uh, would it be appropriate? Uh, I guess the fore case is that there's been a long-term vulnerability to anxiety demonstrated in David's case. Uh, there's a relatively low-risk treatment option available that might significantly lower his uh, arousal and anxiety levels and improve his mood. Against that, though, he's not had a good trial of a psychological treatment. Uh, we don't know uh, how he's going to respond. And there are significant, uh, although small, uh, risks of side effects uh, from uh, medication. Uh, so I think that's probably um, where I'll end it. Um, and I think there are some key questions perhaps left unanswered that we can discuss. Um, thank you. Great. Thank you, Julian. And I knew you could do it for us. I knew you could take us from football to Shakespeare in one fell swoop. So thank you very much for that. And I think what you did um, really well, and, and I think coming last as well, was probably um, really useful, that, that idea around the multidisciplinary approach and, and the complexities of, of cases like David and others and the need to actually work together to really tease out and, and to bring the sense of, of different workers. And I could see in the chat as well people starting to share some of those ideas and talking about different kinds of therapies and, and different practitioners and the role of NDIS and all those kinds of um, conversations starting to happen. So people in the chat box have been doing a lot of um, giving each other um, support and ideas as well and as well as what the panellists have been um, giving us. So I think it's been very rich. Um, a lot of information so far. We do have a little bit of time for some questions and answers. And as Julian said, there might be some questions that are, that are still um, looming for you. So we do have a poll. You can see there that this is going to pop up in a moment um, around some of the themes. And these are the themes that came through on registration. So when you registered and you were asked if you had a question, and we did get lots. And these were the kinds of themes that came up, and I think they're the kinds of themes that I could also see coming up in the chat box as well. So we're going to have a poll that's going to um, be put up right now. So Ron from Redback, if you could do that for us, and just take a moment to choose the one theme that you'd like the panel to discuss. And we could be taking some bets, really, to think about which ones might come up. I'm not sure if anyone's got any ideas about which ones are most likely. If people are polling now, hopefully you'll get to do that and then we'll get to finish that in, um, in a very short time so that we can actually have a look. And then I've got some pre-prepared questions, which were prepared earlier, of course, that we can, um, that we can talk to as well and get, get a little bit more out of this panel before we, we let them go. Okay, so we'll stop that there and we can see that assessment diagnosis questions have come up the most. Yeah, and then strategies to engage. So we can't go back to Hamlet, I'm sorry, Julian, that's, that's done. So we do have some questions there that I can talk about in terms of assessment and diagnosis. Um, so one of the questions that came through earlier, and we can decide who, which panellist wants to jump in here, and there might be a couple of you. Um, what is the most accurate assessment in diagnosing Asperger's? But I think, um, Mandy, you, you said that it's autism spectrum disorder now rather than Asperger's is the latest DSM-5. Where do I find the correct. clinical criteria now that it's no longer classified on DSM-5? So that's the question, really. So would, would you like to take that one, Mandy, in terms of the diagnosis um, and changes? I'll start, and anyone else who wants to jump in, um, please do in the panel. Um, we consider it to be an autism spectrum and uh, with a number of comorbid conditions including intellectual disability and potentially language disorder for people with an intellectual disability. And so we don't diagnose Asperger's disorder anymore. A person with Asperger's disorder would typically be someone who um, had that lower level of support, level one, or may not actually, might meet some criteria, but at that time being be doing quite well, but I guess if they're doing quite well, they're not going to be um, coming in to see you. Um, so we, we diagnose by, by DSM-5. That being said, people um, on the autism spectrum, they often like to hire functioning people, very cognitively able people, like to refer to themselves very often as being on the spectrum or they might refer to themselves as Asperger's or Aspie. And certainly if people have already had that diagnosis, 
they'll come and I think it's going to remain there as something that we understand as typically reflecting a person on the autism spectrum who has good cognitive abilities. But sometimes it's not helpful to focus on that because someone who has good cognitive abilities doesn't necessarily um, not need some assistance as we see with David. So um, people with Asperger's uh, disorder or Asperger's syndrome as it was in the past um, can still quite often need uh, a lot of help. So we should be using those levels of, um, and, and we should be using the DSM-5 criteria when we diagnose. Great, thank you. Anyone else want to jump in with anything to add to that or are you happy with what Mandy's given us there? Um, it's Anna here and I just wanted to briefly mention um, a project which I'm part of, um, it's being led by researchers based in Perth, Western Australia, but they're actually, we're actually looking at developing the first national guideline for diagnosis of autism to be used across Australia and across the lifespan. So looking at what sorts of assessments should be used, what sorts of health professionals should be used in the process, and is it enough just to give a diagnosis or does there need to be uh, additional assessments um, done around specifically what sort of supports an individual needs and making sure they have access to that. So at the moment I actually have an honours student who is um, going to be doing interviews with adults on the spectrum who have a, who've been diagnosed as an adult or who are seeking an autism diagnosis at the moment or who identify as autistic but for whatever reasons have decided to not get an autism diagnosis to really um, inform that diagnostic guideline. So I think that will be launched in September, so for individuals um, to keep an eye out for that, um, yeah, because that hopefully will, will bring a lot of um, good information to people working in the area and diagnosing autism. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know whether there's any room for one more response at all um, here. Yes. Um, I, I think, Anna's uh, on the money that there's significant concern around people uh, who may not have received a diagnosis. Uh, of course, not everybody diagnosis, but where it's being actively sought, uh, the key I think is, uh, you know, this is something that clinicians like me do really poorly. Um, I found the NICE guidelines uh, quite helpful uh, from the UK, uh, that also in addition to really stressing the need for comprehensive and multidisciplinary um, multi-team assessments and integrating all of that information, I uh, recommend some specific tools including uh, you know, a screening tool like the autism spectrum quotient, of course, but then more specific tools that uh, often uh, in involve much more in-depth observation or um, interview. Uh, so some of these are relevant uh, to people uh, more high-functioning autism. Uh, so there is a, an Asperger-specific diagnostic interview, uh, and of course there are many um, different tools that. Uh, more um, autism diagnostic interviews that can be um, used. Uh, so I, I would recommend that if people are interested to pursue uh, the NICE guidelines and the recommendations, that's one of the things that I found especially helpful. And it's available freely on the website. Yeah. Um, just, just to add to that, I think that um, if, if you use those guidelines that Julie's talking about, but also in the DSM, you, you do look at the levels of support. You really need to do more than just make a diagnosis to determine the level of support that the person requires. I think it's also important is um, what some overseas research in particular is showing that some of these adults who haven't been diagnosed are actually coming to practitioners first with a mental health problem. So there was one recent study that I read from the, I think it was from the UK in 2016 and it was published, where about, um, they looked at people who'd been referred for a mental health problem, usually anxiety or depression, but not always. Um, and about half of those people actually had an autism spectrum disorder, had autism spectrum disorder, came away with an autism spectrum disorder um, diagnosis. And one of the things that I think from memory was anxiety was, was more prevalent in particular in the people who came away with an autism spectrum disorder um, diagnosis. 
Okay, so that comorbidity is a really important thing to tease out and again, reinforcing the need for us to, to kind of work together, I guess, to, to make sense of, of what's happening. Now, I'm very conscious that our time is getting away and the um, other area of the, the other theme, I guess, that came through in the poll was strategies to engage. So I'm wondering in wrapping up, each of you might maybe think about what you think might be one of the key areas in terms of engaging. We have had some of these, these conversations already, but what would be you know, your take-home tip in terms of a strategy to engage um, David? And perhaps even consider his, his parents because we, we do see that he's, he's living with family and they're playing a really important role and I guess part of this might be engaging them in, in any of the strategies as well. So who'd like to start in there kind of wrapping up takeaway message but maybe tailor it in that way? Who'd like to go first? Um, I, oh, am, I, am I on? Yeah, I'm not sure whether you can hear me. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that one of the key things is to really spend some time talking to David when he's, you know, one-to-one. -one. I mean, he's, he's able to, I mean, he's high-functioning, he's got anxiety, as we know, he's, he's anxious, and but he's, if he's comfortable with you and you're his primary uh, health person or, or you're his psychologist, um, I think that if you can as a... Um, um, you know, a c conversation and uh, and tailor what he wants. I think it's important to reflect to him that you want to hear what he has to say about who he he wants to engage or help him engage with treatment or management. I think sometimes as health professionals we tend to disregard. We, we like to be the expert and tell people what to do. And I think that people with intellectual disability and people particularly with high-functioning autism, just because they can't communicate as well or have difficulty or we think they have difficulty communicating, we, we, we need to try to go that extra step to give them the time to tell us what they want. And I think we need to um, present some options and hear what they have to say. Hi, then um, you're currently on mute. I'm on mute. So I'll say that again. Thank you, Aileen. And I, I guess what we're trying to do with David is to encourage him to um, become a little bit more independent, perhaps, and, and thinking for himself, mm. which is part of that, that family dynamic that, that's been created. Thank you, Aileen. Who'd like to build on, on that? Um, Who'd like to go next? I'd like to build on the communication because something's occurred to me that we um, possibly haven't touched on sufficiently in relation to communication and that is that David is high functioning and therefore his language will seem fine but the, he can potentially have subtle language issues that we may not think of so uh, using a metaphor how we um, question or question or give um, information to him or suggestions to him are open to misinterpretation potentially and this is in a slightly different context, but this was borne home to me when we did some work with tertiary students on the autism spectrum and we spoke to them and their families and also to our university tutors and lecturers and TAFE teachers. And I'm reminded, for example, of uh, one of our teachers, uh, university tutors, saying about a person with autism who was asked if they had finished their assignment and the student said yes. The student failed the subject because part of the message that hadn't, that was implicit, was that you now need to submit it so it can be marked and he never submitted the completed piece of work. So we need to make sure our communications are very clear and unambiguous. Mm. Yep. Thank you. That's really important advice, and, and again, can be hidden in terms of people looking like they understand or seeming like they understand, and that literal understanding is, is complex. Thank you. Who'd like to build on that? Anna or Julian? Who'd like to go next? Um, I'm happy to go next. Um, Anna. I think uh, I'm really just um, reiterating the importance of um, having time and taking time to get to know the person. 
um, getting to be able to build that rapport so they do feel comfortable with um, talking to you. Um, and as Mandy mentioned, really getting to know how they communicate and whether they are someone who has difficulties with understanding metaphors and, and, and things like that and really trying to understand how you need to communicate with them. And you can ask them, you can ask individuals about how is the best way for you to communicate with, with them and they will most likely tell you, you know, um, you know, can you please, you know, write things down for me in, in, in advance or, you know, it's really important or, you know, can I, some people might want to record conversations so they can then later go back to them when you're no longer with them. So actually I think, you know, a really important thing is talking to people about what are the best ways for you to communicate with them because um, in most cases they might be able to just tell you what works for them. Great. Thanks, Anna. And that's that's another good practical tip, I guess, that we might not always think about doing or might not feel that that's a good thing to do. So it's great to hear that. And that leaves you again, Julian. How would you like to finish off? Thank you. Uh, here I think there are two aspects to engagement for me. One is with David and thinking about how you uh, really engender a, a person-centred approach in your clinical practice uh, but be sensitive to perhaps David's passivity and anxiety in that that might actually make it uh, more difficult for him to be at the centre of that consultation. So gradually as rapport is uh, developed uh, and over a series of sessions, I think that uh, uh, can be overcome so that he's truly at the centre and so that the clinician is really uh, thinking uh, of his perspective and actually checking in really what he wants to do as far as the next steps, and that he's adequately informed about the range of options, uh, the likelihood of success of those options, uh, and uh, they can uh, be carried out with his um, engagement. I think the other aspect um, of engagement is between uh, the professionals involved in supporting David. To me, um, this can be aided by improving our communication with one another. Uh, with David's permission, information sharing uh, becomes a really important part of that. Um, often this is done uh, in uh, the form of letters or electronic communications, but taking the time where possible for multidisciplinary uh, case conferencing. Uh, and the question again here is if that's really uh, person-centred, uh, that should also involve spending time with David uh, if he's able to tolerate that and support that idea but making sure that we're um, creating frameworks where we can share information re regularly, support and encourage one another, and actually develop a, um, a priority in, ma in our management that uh, really reflects uh, David um, at the centre. Uh, very difficult to do. I'm being somewhat idealistic, but I do think we need to be challenged to move in that direction. Thank you, Julian, and nothing like ending with a good challenge and, and idealism at the same time. And, and I guess we, we're hearing the, the consistent messages around um, collaboration and, and working together and, and then how that actually happens, of course, is much more difficult than it, than it sounds. So I appreciate all those ideas. We are at the end of our time. It always goes so quickly and it always feels like we've got so much more to talk about or we're just starting the conversation. But I, I know that there's been a lot of information that will be really useful to people that's been shared. I know there's been a lot of chat that's happened in, in the chat box and there are resources that you can um, access so that you can actually um, go away. And if all the questions haven't been answered, hopefully some of them will be in there as well. But I think core messages around collaboration, working together, supporting each other, keeping clients at the centre, building rapport, all of those things have come through really very clearly. So thank you very much to everybody for their participation. So thank you very much to the panel for their work in preparing for, for this evening and, and for being here and, and for sharing your expertise. And, and we know that we've just touched the surface, but, um, but we've got a lot of insights as well. Just a reminder again, if you wait to complete the exit survey just before you log out, it'll come up on the screen as we, as we close. Certificates of attendance for the webinar will be issued within the next couple of weeks and you'll also be sent a link to the online resources that, that come with the webinar. And we do have um, the next webinar coming up on the 17th of August, which is another um, challenging topic and um, big topic that I hope you will join us for, coordinating mental health care for people experiencing suicide bereavement. And that's on Thursday, 17th of, of August, same time and, and channel, really.
Um, the other last point before we do finish off is um, if you're interested in joining an MHPN um, network, and this is really about what the theme coming through was around supporting the engagement and ongoing maintenance practitioner networks, and this is something that, that came through. Julian particularly talked about that, where clinicians from different disciplines meet regularly with other mental health practitioners and share tips and resources, build local referral pathways and engage in, in CPT activities. So this is something that um, you can join and you can see there there's a list of, of networks and you can join one today um, or if you're interested in setting up your own that there's the opportunity to get some support to do that as well and there's a website if, you, if you're interested in, in doing some more of that. Don't forget the panel on the, um, the um, little folder with all the information and um, just the survey again before, before you leave and thank you again everybody for your contribution and, and participation in this evening's event. Good evening.